Good afternoon. Um, welcome to our monthly webinar, Gray Associates Demand for Higher Education Program, um, looking at bachelors and above. A few housekeeping items before we get started. At the bottom of your screen, there's the chat. We're always looking for feedback. So if you have any technical questions or comments, please put them in there. Um, there is also a Q&A section at the bottom. If you have any questions, put it in there for two reasons. One, people can upvote that. And three, I get a printout of that. And if we do not get to your question or a program that you would like to see towards the end, we can always follow up with you and make sure we um, answer anything you have. In addition to that, today we will be looking at a specific program of the month that Bob will get into in a few minutes. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our founder and author, Robert Atkins. Thank you very much, Ned. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Much appreciated to take time out of your busy day and learn a little bit about demand for higher ed, both in terms of student demand and employer demand. Let me just take a second there, because uh, it's a big assumption that's made in higher education often uh, that employer demand is all you really need to know about. Uh, and it's not true. Uh, and in many cases, when you look at the kinds of institutions who tend to decline recently, they often do a lot of work on employer demand, but they forget that you know if students don't come to school, it's a moot point what employers want. And so we believe it's terribly important to understand both. It's not that employer demand isn't important, but you also need to know if students are interested in the program. So um, that also, by the way, is one of the premises in my book, Stop, Start, or Grow, available to you on Amazon, my shameless plug for my book, um, which is still relatively new, just came out in May. And it lays out really our whole uh, approach to data-informed academic program evaluation and management. So what we've done and what we really believe is important when you're looking at programs is to have a robust program evaluation system. Now, a system is not, in our view, is not just data. It's not just software. It includes the data, software, people, and process required to make good decisions. Now, on the information side, you need to know about markets, which we'll cover today, but you also need to know about margins. What are the economics of your academic programs? You, of course, need to know whether those programs are living up to your own academic standards. And finally, and perhaps most important, you need to know whether those programs are aligned with your mission and how critical they really are to your mission. Because a low performing program in terms of potentially total size or margins may well be essential if it's critical to your mission. And conceptually, what we're trying to do is find margins in larger or more profitable programs so that they can fund less um, contribution positive programs that are aligned with your mission and essential. So, it's all about managing across subsidies between high and low margin programs so that you maximize your mission. All of that needs to be done by including the right people in an open and often overused transparent data informed process. Uh, if you do that, then you get the kind of consensus you need uh, that to move forward in a higher education institution and implement the decisions that you make. Classic top down decision making really doesn't work in higher ed. Consulting recommendations don't work very well either. Um, both tend to be rejected um, out of hand. So you've really got to get people involved in this discussion in an organized and efficient process. In addition to that, we do a couple of other things. We help people optimize pricing and predict how price will change if you, how enrollment will change if you change your price. We do a location analysis to help folks decide where to locate campuses or to market their programs. And finally, we're building more and more robust financial planning models so that you can simulate, for example, changes in your programs or changes in enrollment and understand what the impact will be on your 10-year financials. So uh, I'll walk through our findings for this month. I'll probably be done in a half an hour or so. At the end of my presentation, we'll fire up our program evaluation system and take requests from all of you to look at specific programs, albeit at the national level. So if you have a program you're interested in, please let us know. You can put it in the chat um and or q a and we'll try to get to it again as ned mentioned if we can't get to your program today uh we will get back with, to you um afterwards and share the scorecard for the program of interest now without further ado let's talk about what happened in september google search volumes now many of you've been with me before and you know about this but our charts are fairly simple to read the dark blue bars are 2021 the light blue bars are 2022 and our hope is that the light blue bars are taller than the dark blue bars, which means that demand is growing. And indeed it is. Uh, 2022, so far, uh, the Google search volume has been higher than prior year every month for which we have data. So that's quite encouraging, but it's a medium to long-term indicator. So uh, if you think about 
student searching, depending on the degree level, they may be searching six to 12 months before they'll really decide to enroll. So while it's a great leading indicator, it's probably not gonna solve your enrollment problem tomorrow. So keep that in mind, uh, but it is a very good sign for the, long, the medium or longer term in terms of interest in higher ed at the bachelor's level and above. What are they interested in? Um, so in terms of programs, uh, the highest volume of keyword searches, registered nursing won first place with 633,000. Then we get business, law, and we run it, then we run into some computer stuff, computer science and cybersecurity. Keep those two in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. You'll see it's a recurring theme. Then we have accounting, criminal justice, data analytics, which I tend to put in that same group with computer science, cybersecurity. Um, so again, keep that in mind as we go through. Finally, medicine and physics. Now, in terms of what's growing fastest, artificial intelligence, number one. Cybersecurity, I mentioned to keep your eye on that. Second fastest growing program. Now think about that. It's growing 140% in terms of Google search volumes. And it's all, already one of the largest programs in the United States. So in terms of Google volume. So we're talking about a very big program growing very fast. Data analytics at 115%. Again, one of the bigger ones still growing at a high percentage rate. And then we see some more, uh, one that I find very intriguing. It's been coming up consistently enough now that I believe it's a real trend. Cinematography, film, video production is up 84%. Then registered nursing, Homeland Security, project management, marketing, marketing management, speech, communication, rhetoric, and school counseling guidance services. So if I were sort of putting these together in a theme, I'd say we have a lot about uh, information technology slash big data, AI, cybersecurity, data analytics, a uh, little bit of health, and then a mishmash of other things. Now, what do international students want? Uh, first, overall, they want to come to the U.S. more than they did before. International page views for U.S. programs are up 22% year over year. Another very promising sign if you can figure out how to get your foreign students through, uh, through immigration and, and onto your campuses. What are they looking for? Well, business led the list this month. Um, computer science followed that. Again, we see data science, so that pair coming together. Business analytics, the third part of that engineering, computer and information security, again, hearkening back to the prior charts, um, computer software engineering. Finally, we see some health, uh, health services, allied health, design and visual communications and marketing, marketing management. So a couple of thoughts here to keep in mind. Uh, when foreign students are applying to the US, it's very attractive for them to, to come into your STEM fields because they get a better visa on the backside and have more time to get a job. They're also well aware that uh, jobs in the U.S. are very are plentiful for people coming out of those disciplines. So um, computer science, data science, business analytics, I think really have some likes here in the international community. Where are those leads coming from? India led in page views for computer information security. Uh, Nigeria was second, and that always surprises me, but it's a very consistent trend in our data. Third, Iran. I can imagine why students want to leave there these days. Bangladesh, Ghana, Pakistan, Nepal, UK, Turkey, and Ethiopia even makes the list. Curiously for me, the state that was most popular was Georgia. We don't usually see this. It's typically gonna be either um, California or Massachusetts that's top of the list. This may be Georgia Tech in some of its initiatives, but in any case, Georgia is actually the hottest market in terms of where international students want to attend school. Now, this to keep everything in mind. So we've done Google search, we looked at international. Now let's look at something that's much closer in enrollment. What did students actually enroll in in the most current period? That period is spring 2022. And the first message is that the enrollment declined, which is very disappointing, both at the bachelor's level and at the master's level. It's down 5% this year. After growing a little bit last year, I sort of thought we put this decline behind us. And at the master's level, it grew strongly last year, but we gave a big chunk of it back this spring. So a little disappointing to me that we'd see this kind of decline again. What did they enroll in? Biggest program, not surprising, was business. It is the biggest program in the United States. But the list after that gets very interesting. Computer science, number two. Business analytics, number three. I don't think I've ever seen business analytics come in that high. Normally, number two is nursing. Then we see social work, 
um, education, general accounting, um, and uh, let's see if we go further down, special ed and teacher education at multiple levels. So a little bit of interest in uh, specifically in education, but quite a surprising change in order here at the very top of the list um, with business being stable, but computer science and business analytics moving up ahead of registered nursing for the first time that I can remember. So what grew the fastest? Well, again, you see this trend, information technology, computer science, a little bit further down the page, business analytics. So real interest in those three areas, both in terms of overall size and growth. Then we see a few other things, industrial engineering and management, uh, classic program psychology, applied behavior analysis, a program that I find very interesting, physician assistant. I think it's one of the ways we can start to close the gap that we have in the healthcare community, uh, shortage of doctors basically. And I think that's gonna end up getting filled by physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Health, medical counselor, and finally education up 1%. But look at these, these are very large programs here in computer science and information uh, science studies and business analytics, still growing uh, 11 to 25%. So uh, as we look at spring 2022, business had the highest new, uh, in, new student enrollment of all bachelor's programs, followed by general studies, psychology, computer science, criminal justice, there's nursing, um, very far down the list, uh, which is unusual. And finally, at the tail end, accounting. What grew in terms of bachelor's degree level? Uh, computer science. And here's cybersecurity again, up 22%. And that's interesting. That's the last we see of that sort of cluster of computer science and cybersecurity. Then we see marketing. English is up. Um, don't see that often. So I think that's interesting. There may be some kind of a bounce back in English and maybe I could even hope for the liberal arts in general. Um, but here we see human services, another top two or two, two of those together. Uh, finance, elementary education, general studies, uh, business administration management general. That's kind of a uh, loose category. I wouldn't spend much, pay much attention to that. And finally, education general. Employment is a different picture. Remember, we saw growth in enrollment. I'm sorry, growth in, in Google search, optimistic for the future, a small decline in enrollment. And on the job side, we see things kind of falling out of bed. Uh, we're down 39% year over year. Uh, for the unusual to see this decline month over month be so steep as well. Um, September's down well over 10% uh, from August. Uh, obviously, we're starting to see the impact of the Fed and a little bit of recession hitting these numbers. They're still relatively healthy compared to 2020, but um, starting to weaken in a very noticeable way. What had the highest job postings? Now nursing gets back to its number one spot. It is the... Uh, degree with, uh, excuse me, the occupation uh, with the highest number of um, job postings. Then we see software developers, not surprising, engineers, managers, um, a handful of management jobs here, managers, other general and operations managers, and then a little bit further down marketing managers and information technology managers, which I grouped actually under Infotech. And then you see the Infotech, three of those on this list um, with software developers, computer systems, architects, and Infotech project managers. And here's another big slug of nurses, uh, 26,000 critical care nurses needed. So we've got what used to be called the shortage of, in nursing, um, I think has really reached an acute level now. Uh, there are only a couple million nurses in the United States. So we've got a very substantial percentage of the total workforce that's now an open job position. Now, what grew fastest? This is time for the bad news. And we're seeing this across degree levels. Uh, the number one thing out there in terms of job growth, tax preparers. Uh, hopefully those are not tax auditors, um, but this, you know, I used to think of this as a seasonal thing. And you'd see it come up in January, February, March, as H&R Block and other tax preparers hired people. But that's not the case now. This has been uh, coming up at the very top of our list for several months, up 97% this month. Bob, quick question. Um, somebody wants to know if that you think that's correlated with the federal government's ability to hire 87,000 more IRS people. Would that be related to that posting? You know, I think it's very possible that that's what's going on. Um, those aren't precisely tax preparers, though. 
uh, but it may be being classified in the same place. So I do think that's uh, potentially what's underlying that. Uh, then we see a couple of pharmacy things. Uh, pharmacy aids and pharmacists up 20, 24 and 32%. And uh, this is consistent with my recent observations. I went in to get my booster and uh, the line was you know, long at the pharmacy. And the pharmacist said that the reason was that he was covering both giving the uh, shots as well as the back of the desk because they couldn't hire people uh, to fill those jobs at CVS. So there's a real shortage here, uh, both at the pharmacist and the assistant level. Environmental engineering technologists are next. Uh, I'm gonna jump down, you see another engineer there, civil engineers. Uh, and then we see nursing instructors. This has been a problem for a long time, 12% up. Uh, very hard, one of the reasons we don't have more nurses is we can't find the nursing instructors to teach them. Um, so an important bottleneck there uh, for nursing programs and ultimately for the healthcare industry as a whole. And then we have graduate teaching assistants, auditors, and finally financial managers. Now, many of you are worried about certificates and non-degree courses, if you will, the short programs. So in order to shed some light on that, what we do is go to the two of the biggest massively online open course providers, MOOCs, um, and see what's hot on their sites. And these guys charge nothing or very little for a given uh, course and often issue certificates along with those courses once they're completed. So what, what's going on there? Uh, well, let's start with Coursera. Uh, the numbers on the right are cumulative enrollment here. So since this program was first offered, how many people have been enrolled in it? And data analysis is number one by a wide margin with 17 million students enrolled. Now, again, don't think that's last month or even last year. That's how many students have enrolled since they started offering data analysis on Coursera. Uh, learning English, I found interesting to hit this high. Number two, my guess is that's not really a US thing. I'm thinking that's mostly gonna be international students learning English, but we can't really tell. Uh, number three is machine learning. So again, that's the, the items I mentioned at the beginning, data analysis, machine learning, uh, cybersecurity are, are, tend to be very big across everything we're looking at these days. Basic science, you can see software development a little bit further down, um, and a little bit of design here, design and product, and then music and art at the back of the list. Well, at the, at the, among the largest programs, I mean, we're still talking about 7 million students in music and art on Coursera. So what actually happened in September? So what we do is we go in and we look at the last month's cumulative enrollment, we subtract it from this month's, and we can tell how many people enrolled in these courses in the last 30 days. So fundamentals of graphic design is top. I found it interesting. There are three design related uh, courses here. Fashion is design is about midway down the list. And, excuse me. And finally, visual elements of user interface design at the bottom, all with well over 150,000 students enrolled last month. Then we see photography, uh, creative writing, cameras and exposure, and getting started with essay writing. Did I miss something? Fundamentals, oh, and then we have a couple of musics here. Uh, music theory and guitar for beginners, uh, making the top in terms of growth month over month. Excuse me, total enrollment. Now, what's growing? Even though it's very, very large, the data analytics is still the fastest growing program on Coursera. Uh, data design, excuse me, design and product picks up that design theme. And um, these are, by the way, the categories as opposed to individual courses um, on Coursera. We've got some language interest there, leadership and management, the top four, uh, personal development, finance, marketing at the bottom, and finally mobile and web development. Let me transition now back to a look at student demand and employment, as well as competition for one program that we cover. First, those four categories are the categories I think are most important, uh, three of the four categories I think are most important when you're evaluating the market for an academic program. As I mentioned, it's student demand, employment, competition, and the last one's degree fit, or what degree level is appropriate for this program. Well, when we do this, we take about 50, variables and we weight them and score them and we rank programs. And so you can see up here, uh, registered nursing number one overall with this particular ranking system for bachelor's programs, a hundredth percentile in student demand. So it's the highest volume, uh, highest overall score for student demand amongst 
all 1500 programs we track, very good on competitive intensity and very good on employment as well. So that leads it to be the, the highest ranked program of the 1500 that we track. So a little bit further down the list, you can see animal sciences. And this month we're gonna dive in and take a look at that program. When we do that, remember we use color codes. Um, so if you're tired of looking at all these numbers, just look at the colors and get a very good idea of what's going on. Dark green is 98th percentile or higher. 95th to 98th is that medium green, light green at the 90th percentile. And from there, things are starting to get worse and it ends over in pink at the 40th percentile below. So simple way to remember it is green is good, red or pink, not so great. Now, I, I have to say I was a little surprised when I look at animal sciences to see just how high it does rank. Uh, we're at the 96th percentile overall uh, in, in terms of student demand with a score of 20. Why? Well, we've got about average Google search volume, a little bit better, third quartile, 74th percentile, a very strong international interest, 94th percentile, and new student enrollment uh, up at the 97th percentile at 5,750. Uh, new students enrolled, so very strong enrollment volume. Uh, finally, we can look at on ground and online. Uh, not surprisingly, dealing with um, animal sciences, uh, very little being done online here. It's almost all being done on ground. We have a handful, 43 uh, students who took this online. Now, that I find that interesting because while it's somewhat obvious that you wouldn't want to take this program entirely online, uh, when, when we're counting that, we're using iPads and they will put something as online if it's uh, both online and uh, partially online, you know, hybrid online plus on ground. And I'm very surprised that folks aren't using that for this particular program and trying to build their audience by being able to offer a hybrid program where, there, yes, there's an on ground piece that you have to go in for, but an online component to that as well. So to me, that looks like an opportunity. Let's look a little bit further down here. Uh, Google search, again, about average. Um, we've got new student enrollment um, in terms of growth up 340, 98th percentile completion volume at the 96th percentile. So when I look at the growth rate overall, it's not, it's not the best, but it's pretty persistently above average on a percentage basis. And it's already a large program. So on a unit basis, these growth rates are pretty substantial. And even on a percentage basis, we're looking at 11%, 6%, and 4%. And I don't know about you, but almost all the colleges I talked to would be delighted to be seeing uh, growth rates at 4% and above. Now let's turn to employment, a uh, bit of a different picture. So I'm gonna walk you through two ways of looking at this. Uh, one is what we call direct prep, and the other is what uh, we call the ACS bachelor's outcomes, or you can think of those as generalist jobs. So first, what is direct prep? Well, direct prep is when you study for in a given area and you go on to get a job for which that uh, program of study is directly related. So for example, nursing students go on to become nurses. And, and in fact, they do. 82% uh, of them go on to become nurses. So very close relationship between the field of study and the job people get. However, that is not normally the case. So if I look right at the bottom here, it says percent in direct prep jobs. Um, only 13% of people who get a degree in animal sciences actually go into a field related, related to animal sciences. I say that again, only 13% of people who get a degree in this program go on to a field, uh, an occupation that is directly related to it. So 87% of folks are doing something else. So while these think job numbers at the top under direct prep are a little anemic, 65th to 67th percentile. The ACS bachelor's results, where we take in the, the jobs that people really do, not just the jobs that they're supposed to have done, the direct prep jobs, suddenly we see it's actually quite large, 91st, 92nd percentile in terms of overall job openings in the fields these folks really go into. Growth, not so great, down 5% last year. 3% uh, historic, uh, sorry, the three-year historic growth rate up 1.6%, decent growth, 62nd percentile. Uh, the, the issue is kind of wages. They're, they're not very exciting here. We've got um, 10th percentile wages at 31,000, mean wages at 46,000. And you can see in the ACS part, we're looking at folks with grad bachelor's degrees. Uh, we do get up to 90,000. 
Now, one of the complicating factors in this field and many others is that in animal sciences, people go, you can enter this uh, occupa the set of occupations at, at any level from a vet tech to a veterinarian. Um, and the, the vet tech side, you're going to be bringing down the average wages, and obviously the veterinarians will be bringing them up. So uh, it's a very broad field in terms of level of education that may be required if you stay in the area, in, the, in one of the areas that's related to this degree. So job posting volumes slipping a bit. Um, it was pretty healthy, uh, but dropped 11% in August uh, this year. And actually we're down in June and July as well. So a bit of a troubling trend there in terms of overall volume of job postings. When we look at uh, what particular job, the highest volume of job postings for folks in this area, vet technologists and technicians is number one. Now, recall that's really a two-year program, not a four-year program, um, and very low wage. Uh, you're typically going to see minimum wage here, uh, but 16,000 job openings. And then we get to a very interesting list. Um, First-line supervisors of farming, fishing, and forestry, 7,000 job postings. Veterinarians, 5,000 job postings. I'm going to guess, I'm not sure about this, that that's about as many people, uh, that's more people than graduate every year in this program. So there's a, uh, looks like a, what might be becoming a shortage of veterinarians, uh, somewhat surprising to me. And then we get farmers, ranchers, agricultural managers, ag uh, sciences teachers, animal scientists, farm and range managers, animal breeders, uh, horticulturalists, and aquaculture managers. Personally, I'm lining up to get a job as a fishing manager. I'm not quite sure what that is, but I, I, if I had to manage something, I'd just as soon manage somebody fishing, uh, hope maybe not on a commercial basis. Now, I mentioned the NCS crosswalk issue, and let me just put some numbers around that so that we don't take to heart too much the narrow number of jobs available in the direct prep fields. Uh, I mentioned that there's only one program that, that has over 80% of folks who graduate from that program go on into the field, that's nursing. Um, so yes, some, field, some programs are directly related to what people do, but after you leave nursing, the relationship breaks down. And for 896 out of the 1,061 programs we looked at, less than 20% of the people graduating from those programs are gonna go into fields for which the National Center for Education Statistics says they're directly prepared. So rough numbers, 90% of programs, Fewer than 20% of the people are going to go into the fields which are directly prepared. Now, you might ask why that is. Well, part of it is that quote on the left hand side here that this NCS SIPSOC crosswalk is not based on actual empirical data, which is a little bit troubling. What is it based on? Well, it's based on what the um, labor market economists think those people have been prepared for, and the assumption that what they've been prepared for is pretty narrow, and that that's what it makes sense for them to go do. So as often as the case, people don't do what you think they might do. So in this case, we're looking at five fields that somebody could go into according to NCES. And you can see what they are. They're things that you would expect, farmers, animal scientists, agricultural technicians, ag science teachers, and farm and home management educators. Pretty narrow set of things. And with a couple of exceptions, very low paid. Ag now, and you look at what's really going on, and it's a little bit different. Um, we've got five programs I mentioned that people supposedly are going to go into, according to NCS. Um, but what we find is they actually go into 410 different occupations. Now, that to me is a big miss. I, you know, this kind of estimation, if you're within five or ten percent, it's forgivable because the numbers just aren't that precise. When I have to multiply by a hundred to correct it, that's a problem. So what do they really do? Well, unsurprisingly, that many become veterinarians. That's number one. We do have farmers, ranger, rangers, ranchers, and agricultural managers at number two. But then we have just other manufacturers. We have sales reps. We have some elementary school teachers. We have ag workers, non-farm animal caretakers, post-secondary teachers, vet techs. And this one surprised me. Tenth on the list is physicians. So I guess it's not that big a transition from big animal studies to studying humans. Um, but uh, anyway, I, again, I always find these lists surprising of what people really do with a degree as opposed to what we think they should do. And um, let's take a look at mid-life income. 
So you may think that this is a low paid field, um, but actually when we look at it, vets do pretty well. They make $123,000 a year. Those farmers, 77, that manager others, 97. Sales reps, 119,000. Um, elementary, yeah, we're down in you know, middle American wages, uh, middle, middle class, 44, 49. Non-farm caretakers, 40. Uh, Post-secondary teachers, 87. Vet techs, I've mentioned, pretty low paid field, 41,000 for mid-career. Um, and then I'm not sure this physician number must be wrong at 41,000. Uh, I don't know any doctors working for those sorts of wages. And when we look at competitive intensity for this program, uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, we've got 85 campuses that offer veterinary, uh, large, excuse me, animal sciences programs. It's a fair number of campuses, and you see that's the 89th percentile. So that's as competitive and just in terms of sheer number of programs offered is all but 10% um, of the uh, programs out there. Uh, the campuses dropped by two. So there are two schools out there who discontinued their animal sciences program. Um, there are only two schools that offered online. But these are very big programs. So average program completion, 76. Median program completion, 66. So again, that's a very large number, 99th percentile on median program completions. That means there are only about 15 programs that are as big as this uh, at, a, at an individual school. We do see a worrisome trend here, slight decline in median um, completions per, per program, it's about 3%. That begins to say that the people who are in the field are having a little bit of trouble filling those classrooms. Um, as we look a little further down for some more evidence, Google Competition Index, actually pretty heartening. Uh, that's at 0.28. Uh, it's a zero to one scale with one being most competitive. And that's the 29th percentile. So that's actually relatively low competition. Cost per click, a little bit higher, 62nd percentile, but still far from toxic. Um, so I look at this and I, I would judge that this is actually not saturated yet. There's still room for growth and it's a very large program. Now, uh, when we we're going through this, we got to think about also what degree level do you want to offer this at? And by and large, animal sciences appears to be a bachelor's degree, um, both in terms of what people complete and also in terms of the folks employed. Um, but really, when you look at what, what's happening in the fields that these folks go into, um, it's a bit all over the place. Uh, we've got no college at 33%, some college at 18%, associates, and it goes right on up to doctoral. So I think what's happening here is there are a variety of fields you can go into. And the credentials required in those fields are very, very different from a vet tech where it's uh, a, a certificate on up to becoming a vet where you need a doctoral degree. Now, who takes this? And I want to take a second on this very important concept that when you're making program decisions, you want to take into account that uh, the program comes along with its own demographic fingerprint. That is, it has a unique makeup in terms of gender and ethnicity. So depending on what programs you pick or what programs you grow, you'll actually change the makeup of your campus. In this case, interesting enough, animal sciences skews white and skews very heavily female. 82% of the completions in this program are female, 18% male. Compare that to the national average where it's about 60% female to 40% male, this one's right out there almost with nursing in terms of skewing towards uh, female students. Second largest group in terms of ethnicity, Hispanic or Latino. So if I'm thinking about the makeup of my campus, this is gonna give me more women and it's gonna increase the Hispanic population in particular. Now, let me share the one pager, if you will. This is what we call a scorecard. We put all those components together we shared with you earlier. So you can see on one page, all the statistics for this particular program. And uh, again, let's focus on the color codes. You can see overall it's dark green. So know immediately that's a very good program on most dimensions. Uh, light green on student demand, medium green actually. So it's pretty good on student demand. Weaker on employment, and that's because of all those issues we had down here with wages. You can see they're highlighted in pink. And finally, competitive intensity. Uh, looks pretty good overall with these two strong greens. So one of the things I want to encourage you is as you use this sort of tool, um, the colors are really helpful. 
and they allow you to really focus in on what matters. What's very strong about this program? Immediately obvious. Where's a weakness? Over here. And then even within a strong category, what are the pros and cons? Again, very much at a glance. And as you get more experienced using these, you really can take a look in a, in a, in a minute or two, you can, you'll quickly be able to identify a very weak program. Um, the middle ones are always the toughest and it's also very obvious when you hit one that's very, very good. Let me summarize. In September, US Google searches for academic programs went up 16%, but enrollment declined by 7%. What I hope that means is that the near-term growth is weak, but we should see stronger long-term growth as searchers become students. And that's gonna be a six to 12 month cycle as somebody goes from searching for a program to actually enrolling in one. In spring 2022, computer science had the fastest year over year bachelor's degree enrollment growth. At the master's level, the prize was taken by information science. Registered nurses had the highest volume of job postings for bachelor's and above graduates. And as we discussed, tax preparers grew the fastest year over year. Demand for animal sciences, our program of the month, is very high at the bachelor's level. Remember, it's gonna be almost all women. Um, and the jobs and wages that are gonna get as they graduate through that are low. Um, but many of the animal sciences graduates are actually gonna go into other fields um, and are not necessarily gonna experience that wage problem. And there are signs the market set not saturated. Uh, this is one where it's a little bit ambiguous, um, but it looks to us as though there's room for growth uh, within this program. And in particular, if you were thinking of entering, pretty interesting given that the average program graduates 66 people a year. Uh, if you think of that in terms of number of students, multiply by about six for a bachelor's degree program. And you know, you're up into uh, 300, 400 students on campus taking the program, which is very, very interesting. So that's it for the month. Uh, now real I want quick, to- Bob, we actually have a question um, before we move on real quick. Um, cybersecurity popular for degree, but non-credit, not so popular, odd or not? Well, it's pretty popular non-credit too. So um, I would say there are, there are very different rankings actually between certificates and programs. Uh, think of the English ranking high on the, on the certificates. It doesn't rank very high when you look at it in terms of uh, demand. Well, this month it doesn't, it doesn't normally. Um, so I'd say those are not tightly correlated except for tech. Um, and there I would expect them to see them line up pretty well. And if I recall, they actually were close on this one. No, on this month, actually, cyber was a little farther down on the non-degree uh, non credit. Yeah, but you're still talking top 10. There are yep. thousands of programs in the list. So um, it's, it's a little bit out of place, but it's still one of the highest um, in, the, in the entire data set. That's a very big data set. There are a lot of courses offered um, at Coursera and Udemy. We're now going to turn it over to Winnell for um, you guys to ask program to see. But we're as he pulls up his screen, real quickly, I'm going to put out a poll. We're always looking to make sure you guys get the information you need for this webinar. So please take a minute and fill this out, this quick little survey. I really would appreciate it. Yeah, my understanding is we're only at one request right now, and that was for uh, computer science at the master's level. So I'll go ahead and share my screen, Bob. Yeah, if I, if I let you. Thank you. And I'm going to share my screen really quickly. The first view I'm going to open up before the details is going to be the summary view that we have um, just to give us insight, right? What's working, and what's not at a high level for computer science nationally at the master's level. In the student demand section, we see a lot of size and we see above average growth. We'll dive into those numbers a little bit deeper. In the employment data, we're seeing, again, a huge amount of employment opportunities. So the size, volume of employment, whether it's the field size or the job postings, are going to be very large. And then above average growth in wages. And then in the competitive intensity, um, we see that light pink there that's screaming very competitive. Why is it very competitive? The volume of competition here is going to be very large. So things like campuses with graduates that offer this program. But then we're also going to see the average and median completion volumes are also very large, which could represent, you know, large classroom sizes or large completion sizes. Could mean that they're could and, potentially. And it suggests that they're not actually toxically competitive yet. So then we can open up the details here for computer science at the national market here, masters and grad certificates. And we'll start bringing to life some of these metrics. 
And where you see scoring outputs here are areas where this program is being scored on, right? So something like Google search volumes, 840,000 search volumes is very large. When I say very large, right, the system is going to kind of say that for me via the percentile, 99th percentile Google search volume. So again, I'll reiterate, um, compared to all other programs in this market, the national market, not many other programs here are going to be attaining You're this. Talking one of the top 15 programs in the United States. Um, similarly, we're seeing above 99th and 98th percentile for all student demand metrics here, new student enrollment, some of on-ground and online completions. Again, uh, the summary view kind of alluded to this, the size is very large. And then we're going to see actually very strong growth volume as well. Google search volumes are growing very largely um, here at 157,000, 98th percentile. We see an increase in completion volumes as well, 1,200 more completions year over year. Um, but again, this is just a very large program. So although the completion in units is at 1,200, you know, that's why we're also going to bring in the percentage. It's only a 6% growth. Um, just screaming to how large this program is year over year. Enrollment is way up. Um, the 267%, that's high, one of the highest numbers we've ever seen in our system. So the nature of the program review here in the scorecard is going to, is designed to allow you to, you know, we're going to consider our students interested, are students taking this class, are they complete or taking this program, enrolling in this program, completing this program, searching this program. Are there employment opportunities? And we're going to see this in a direct prep field, as well as the ACS bachelor's outcome, AKA, you know, the generalist and Bob kind of alluded to, you know, the field that might not be directly related to this program. Still, both are showing a lot of job opportunities, 802,000 job postings nationally at the 99th percentile for direct prep. And we do have the ability, I'm not going to get into it, but just keep in mind, you know, we're, we're not hiding the direct prep. You can come in here and go into the employment crosswalk and see what we're considering as direct prep occupation codes um, that are feeding into this volume. And then we can also see that the generalist opportunities are large as well. Um, quickly, just want to highlight wages, right? 10th percentile wages, which we consider as that proxy for entry level wages at 47,000. This 47,000 is a 73rd percentile. Um, and then the mean wages here at the 68th percentile for a 76,000. And you'll notice that right now we're in a master's focus. So we're going to actually score the mean wages, which might be more related to a master's level wage than a proxy to entry level wage, which is the 10th percentile wage, which is why you see the NS. But again, because of the percentile, we can still get some strong takeaways as to what that might mean. And notice uh, down below, this is one of those, one of the handful of programs where actually the majority of folks are going to go into fields which are directly prepared. So those direct prep jobs in this case, very relevant. Mm -hmm. And you I know, know the thing I'd like to do that's kind of fun. Um, why, let's pick history. I just keep an, eye, keep an eye on those wages. You all have heard about how there are no jobs for liberal arts graduates and, you know, we're all going to end up, you know, on a hot air vent in New York for a house. Um, as a history major, I've always taken umbrage of that. Some of you may have even heard it before on the webcast. But let's just switch to history and see how it compares. So our 30 to 60 wages in this particular instance are 95,000. Yep. Quickly open up history, general. Look at the wages for those who are suffering hot air habitat history majors. Look at no, then look a little bit further down. The actual NCS of uh, the um, ACS wages, one hundred six thousand dollars. So, put that in your mind as part of the mythology of higher ed. These guys are making ten thousand dollars more a year than computer scientists. Um, and we need to get some of these messages out. There are just unbelievable myths about higher ed. One of them is that you don't need a college degree. And I don't know if you how many of you have seen the recent study at Georgetown, but the ROI on a college investment for let's see, there were three three kinds of colleges that I looked at there. One was uh, liberal arts, one was engineering, one was business. The ROI on each of those is approximately a million dollars over a career. Mm -hmm. And ironically, I thought, you know, they're basically all fundamentally statistically the same. Um, they're within three or $5,000 of each other. But um, actually, the liberal arts colleges came out on top, which I did not expect. And um, not sure I completely believe. But uh, nonetheless, if anybody tells you that 
there isn't the future in the liberal arts. The data suggests otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and just just really quickly, just because there's a couple questions, um, just to bring it back to computer science for a quick second. I did see that question about um, online versus face to face. So we do have metrics that kind of speak to program viability, whether online or on ground, one of them being the size of online, right? So we do see this nationally as a relatively, when I say relatively, right, compared to all other programs, 90th percentile, this is one of the larger online programs. We're also gonna break it down here in competitive intensity to show you that, you know, 21% of all institutions offer computer science online, and then 17% of all completions are happening online here for computer science. Another thing that you wanna be very weary here about is, I know the focus of the review was for a master's level computer science program. The system is designed to make sure we are considering the most appropriate award level, seeing a 21% completion rate across all institutions for this. Uh, at the 21% master. of completions, it's not the completion rate. Yeah, 21% of, of all completions for this program right. happen at the master's level across all institutions. So this is gonna give you the ability to essentially like benchmark yourself against what would be the most appropriate award level. This is a healthy bucket. And another thing that I wanna emphasize is when we're talking about online versus on ground, and we're looking at a field like computer science, there could be a lot of other SIP codes that can relate to your program intention that are being reported out by other institutions. So they might be offering a similar program at another SIP code. So again, there's a lot of different ways that we would wanna make sure we're deep diving into the competitive data to see that online versus on ground. And I probably wouldn't recommend doing it specifically into this very specific zip code. We might wanna take a kind of more macro level view that we're not gonna do now at the 1107s or even the family of 11s as a whole, okay? But again, if there's any other questions there, um, you know, we can, we can figure out a way to get you some of that data. But I think we should move on to uh, uh, supply chain management. Yeah. Actually, I think nurse anesthesi anesthesist. Nurse anesthesiologist. Yes, nurse. This is going to be one of the more higher paid fields uh, we're going to find. Anesthetist, that's it. That's what it is. So again, filtering at the master's level. I think the question was, is it doctoral? Is it master's? We're not sure. Again, the system will speak to that here, right? And we can see that your questions are the same questions that exist in higher ed because it's being offered at both almost evenly, right? Master's and doctoral. 54. In order to actually practice in this field, you have to have a doctoral degree. There you go. Um, which speaks to why there's no ACS data here, right? ACS data is bachelor degree outcomes. Um, you're not enrolling in this program at the bachelor's level, so we're not able to get data here for a bachelor's level outcomes, okay? And uh, Bob kind of mentioned the wages, right? 97th and 92nd percentile wages related to BLS, $98,000 here for a mean wage for a BLS. The, okay. the volumes, though, on demand and stuff, I guess we're looking, again, something that's going to be doctoral level, which intrinsically means we'd be relatively fewer folks that are even qualified to enter the program. Well, uh, so you, you would have to be a nurse to start with, um, at the at bachelor's level nurse to start with. Um, just so you're, you're, you know, it's, it's going to be small compared to most other programs, uh, just because it's, again, pre-filtered. You, you're only addressing a very small population of people. Mm -hmm. who are even qualified to get into it. Um, so I look down at competition. There are only 91 programs in the United States. Median completion is 19. That's pretty healthy. You think about a doctoral program, it's going to run three to six years uh, from start to when that nurse completes. So that 19 gets multiplied by uh, at least half a dozen. So it's 120 graduate students in a program like that on average. It's a pretty healthy sized doctoral program. Uh, and then my cost per click at three bucks, very attractive. My Google competition index, very attractive. So this is an interesting field. I would say not yet saturated um, and very attractive for the nurse that can get through it. And I'm from the Boston area. So my understanding in Boston right now, if you're a nurse anesthetist, you're going to be making closer to 200,000 than 98,000. Um, so it's a, it, it's a very well-paid field. Mm -hmm. Then we have a master's of supply chain management. And then we have a very interesting one here with criminal justice demand. Um, not sure if you mean 
student demand or student interest or what's actually how, uh, happening in the outcomes of the degree. Um, but there's a couple cool cuts that we can we can do in the competitors tab where I can actually break it down by all states and then show you year over year trends by award level across all states to see if we can identify what award levels are increasing in overall completions compared to others for criminal justice. So we'll put a pin on that one um, and we will dump, jive, uh, dive into supply chain management. But yeah, Bob, I don't know if you saw that question about, um, you know, criminal justice demand with, you know, the change in some states to not require a four-year degree for employment as a law enforcement officer. Is that impacting the four-year degree at all? You know, look, um, I'll go look that up in our Google search data and see what, what, happened, what what's in there. It would be interesting to see if it changed year over year after the announcement was made to, because people can get through quicker, correct? But in the time here, sorry, uh, we're looking at a master's in supply chain management um, really quickly. Just want to highlight uh, logistics, material and supply chain is a field that seems to be more exclusively offered at the bachelor's level currently in the national market. Um, we do see 11 percent master's completions though, across all completions in the SIP code. So it does exist at the master's level. And then we're also going to break down the relationship between the program and the field that it serves, right? Those folks working in this field, national workforce, educational attainment, currently have what credential is what this is saying. And we can see 16% bachelors and only 4% masters here, okay? That being said, we see strong student demand metrics. We see strong employment numbers, whether it's Google search volumes on student demand or job posting totals in the employment data. So this is healthy in terms of students interested in this, um, students completing this program. Um, we see healthy growth metrics as well related to student demand. Um, so de student demand is strong. Employment is strong. The wages are just about average here. Um, but we do see a little bit more strength in the ACS wages, right? So um, more of those generalist opportunities where you start with this at the bachelor's level, but you might not end with this or work in a field directly related to this you're seeing $103,000 here as a wage between 30 and 60. Um, you know, that said, this is a, a relatively competitive program, right? Uh, 56 campuses with graduates nationally. Um, and the average and medium completion sizes aren't that large comparative to some of the other programs that we've seen, right? Average completions, 13, median completions, six. But something that I will highlight about this program is the online viability and the way that this is offered you know, it seems like for every two completions, one of them is fully online is, is what this national online percentage of completions is showing here at 47%. And this is going to be one of the larger uh, percentage of online completions that you'll find across all programs nationally. You referenced cost per click, I think. Where can we see that in this report? You'll find that in the competitive intensity. Uh, the, the purpose of that Metric is to give you a sense of if we're going to enter this market, you know, we're going to try to set ourselves apart in that cost per click game. You know, who else is in it and how expensive would it be to leverage some of the keywords? You'll see it here, $29 uh, per click, as well as a competition index from zero to one. The closer you are to one, the more people, the more players that are in this market trying to leverage the same um, keywords. And then there's another place in the system that we don't highlight during this webinar, but a lot of our data sources like Google search volumes and job postings data, right? It's helpful to see that 84,000 job postings. It's helpful to see 226,000 Google search volumes, but it's even more helpful to look at what are those exact keywords? How are they trending over time? How expensive are they? Are there certain months that are more expensive than other months? Are there certain states that are more expensive than other states? And we do give you know the subscribers to our systems the ability to deep dive into those uh, those data sources a little bit deeper because we do know that um, you know the trend data can be just as powerful and and we're going to give you different ways to do some deep dives on those. Okay. And then for criminal justice. Uh, I'm not sure I'm equipped with the data to, to fully give you a, do we see it or do we not yet? Yeah, I don't yeah, know. I'm looking at it now. Um, and you may want to pull it up in the system as well. Let me just share my screen for a moment. Um, uh, let me see. Did the screen share work? I don't think it did. 
Nope. They're just seeing uh, our pretty faces right now. There we go. <laughs> so um, what we've got here is number of searches for the keyword criminal justice, uh, more specific criminal justice, police science. And we've got 108,000, there are about 24 keywords we have associated with that uh, cost per click of 22. What I think you're watching, want to do though, let me, um, so keep in mind this 108,000. Let's go and look and see what that was the prior year. So 80,000, uh, something's going on here. Uh, 80,000 the prior year while the screen refreshes. Um, I'll just go to total search volume. There you go. Um, so actually a pretty sharp jump up in the volume of searches uh, for that those particular keywords. So I don't, it may be that the, the issue that you're concerned about uh, hasn't come through, hasn't worked its way through and dampened student demand. Um, but we, I guess we would say, I don't see a decline yet um, in interest in this program. Remember though, that most of the people applying, let's see, it's entry level. Yeah, I just don't see it. I don't, I don't see a change yet. Okay, back to you, Winnell. Yeah, I'm also looking at something really quickly here. Um, in that same screen that Bob is looking at, just, just to give you a little bit more insight, um, some of the keywords that we're seeing growing year to date, right? Which is one of my favorite trend metrics because it's going to give me a sense of what keyword is set to be at a higher volume this year than last year. And the ones that are set to grow for criminal justice are online criminal justice. You want to share your screen? Yes, yes, yes. I want to mention as, as you're looking at all this that um, the, these we call data dashboards are, are all part of our program evaluation system you know, markets module. So if you get that the system that shows you the overall uh, scorecard, you also get a half a dozen other systems that can allow you to do this level of drill down into particular data sets, like in this case, Google search volumes. Mm -hmm. And we can see the heat here, right? Which the, the bigger the circle, the more search volumes for a very specific criminal justice police science, which is what I filtered in. And we're going to be able to see online criminal justice is growing by 4,700 at this point compared to at this point last year. Criminal justice associates degree is increasing. Criminal justice bachelor's degree is increasing. We're also seeing things like class, associates, certificate, course, right? So how quickly can you get me into policing is kind of how I'm interpreting this. Those type of search volumes are increasing. So I don't know if that answers the question, but it, it might answer it in a way. I think it did. It looks as though Debbie was, has gotten her as, as happy. Let's see, uh, there's a different question. And if you could bring it up, uh, yeah. Rob has asked the challenge about the challenge with zip codes in particular awesome. for computer science. And he's found uh, you know, that things may be listed under by different colleges in a different zip code. So you get uh, you know, kind of false results. And, and it's, can we look at a higher level so we Perfect. see um, all the related programs? Um, and the answer is at some level, yes. Uh, so if we go back to our program rank, We can go in there, series highlighting two digit SIP. We could pick out the two digit SIP associated with computer science. It's frightening to know that Winnell has these memorized. Yeah, it's, it's pretty bad at this point, but it, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, and what we can do now is see the ranking for all the programs that are uh, in, the, in this general uh, discipline. Mm -hmm. and, and then, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Bob. And and the 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 beauty of a view like this is when you're talking about current programs that you already offer, and forgive me for the alarms in the background. Um, and let's say you want to actualize programs or get a better understanding of which zip codes are bringing in stronger data by quadrant. It's pretty cool because now in the program rank, I can actually sort on employment from high to low. And when I'm looking at this entire family of programs and I'm looking to make changes to my current program portfolio, I can now see that before I dive blindly into computer science, you know, I need to also consider information technology, computer game programming. Yeah, and look at that. Um, let's hold on games for a minute. I always assumed that the number of people who could get a job in gaming would be very small, kind of like many other entertainment industries uh, where 
you know, we, people like to be musicians, but there just aren't jobs for musicians. This is actually quite different. Here, uh, we've got 90th percentile employment outcomes. Mm-hmm. So pretty interesting. Uh, not what I would have expected. And, um, and another question that relates to this exact issue here, Alan uh, said, you know, when looking at iPads, data schools in masters and masters in computer science, Marianne, we got rid of it so fast. Um, SIP code, they use 110101. And that's actually very prevalent. So the general SIP codes are used very fluidly across a lot of institutions. It's the same thing with masters or the MBA SIP code, um, 520201. I've had clients that we've worked with uh, kind of challenge me and say, why are you talking about accounting? Why are you talking about marketing as new programs? We already offer those programs. And then they're surprised to see that their entire business portfolio is actually being reported to a 520201. And it's not actually being broken up into individual SIP codes. So those are all things that kind of we're prepared for. And, and it's why we offer this program rank view so that we work our way from a macro level to a micro level, right? We love when, when clients come to us saying, we want to review this program, but we always challenge to just take a step back, especially when looking at competition. Um, because when we take a deep dive into the competitors, that's where this really becomes very powerful, where you might not see an institution that you were expecting to see in your list if you were just very focused into a very specific six-digit SIP code. Okay. Um, I think uh, we're at the top of the hour. So uh, yes. I want to thank everybody very much for joining us. Um, if you'd like a deeper perspective on how to evaluate academic programs, I would encourage you to go ahead and get the book, Stop, Start, or Grow. Of course, I'm going to keep encouraging you forever about that. but. Um, it's on Amazon. And please join us again next month uh, when we do this. If you're a community college, recognize that we actually do a specific um, program workshop for community colleges. We do it on Wednesdays and we do four-year colleges and graduate programs on Thursdays. So there's one for each. Uh, Please feel free to join the one that's of greatest interest to you.